Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the mailbox for the 10th of June 2011. My name is Total Biscuit, bringing you your daily dose of community interaction, gaming discussion, and all that good stuff. You can email in topics for future shows to mailbox at cynicalbrit.com. That's mailbox at cynicalbrit.com. The game running in the background is Red Faction Armageddon, released today in Europe, and I believe it's out a couple of days ago, in fact, in the US. It involves blowing stuff up. There is a mode where there is nothing but blowing stuff up. I am playing it. Please note the presence of a magnet gun. Yeah, I think I'm going to be playing more of this game. This one comes in from Kyle that says, Why do you think it is that indie companies are often more innovative with respect to game mechanics than large companies, despite the fact that they risk to lose a lot on them? Large companies, Sony, Microsoft, etc., have more money to throw at a new mechanic and less to lose on it because of other investments they have and can make, and yet they stick to tried and true formula that have served them well in the past. It's not to say that they do not change the mechanics of the game, it just seems that they're very slow to do so. Well, I don't think you're looking at it in the correct way. I mean, firstly, indie companies stand to lose a lot. Not necessarily true. The development cost of an indie title is much, much lower. And you have a much smaller team, more often than not. So you're dealing with lower overheads, lower overall development costs, which means that you need to make back less money in order to break even and actually get into a profit situation. So that's not necessarily the case. Secondly, more people are willing to risk $10 on an indie title than they are $60 on a triple A. If something has a quirky mechanic, people will buy it just out of curiosity more so than anything else. And if it doesn't pan out the way they want it to, then they've only lost 10 bucks. Big deal, you can't get a decent dinner for that these days. So that's pretty much irrelevant. And also, there is the fact that indie companies need to use these kind of things to distinguish themselves. They don't have big budget production and they don't have marketing, which means that using innovative mechanics is a good way to attract attention. Because if you put a game together that's got something a little bit crazy about it, then it can generate publicity. And as a result, you get articles on sites that wouldn't usually feature you, brand awareness raises, and that's the most vital thing for indie game developers right now, is the ability to market themselves. Now, indie game developers have been struggling an awful lot with that over the past few years, and that's one of the main reasons I actually started doing WTF is, because I realized I had a platform to help out indies, and I've been following indie games for years. I've also been following games that failed, which didn't deserve to fail. I used to be a big proponent of a site called Home of the Underdogs, which hasn't been updated in many years now. It was a home for abandoned wear, and generally speaking, it had a lot of games that didn't sell very well and just weren't available on the market anymore. And when I started doing WTF is, my main goal at the end of the day was to get to the stage where I could say, that game isn't going to fail. Let's make sure it doesn't fail. I didn't want to see innovation thrown down the toilet again. There's too many good titles that have been thrown away as a result of people simply not buying them because they didn't have the marketing presence or whatever other reason. And stopping that from happening, I think, is the duty of gamers that actually want good games in future. Whatever the case, I'm a little bit soapboxy right now, so let's get off the high horse. And it comes down to, look, Sony, Microsoft, and all those development houses and publishers, of course, have a lot of money to throw at big budget production values, backed up by a lot of marketing. And that's really the big deal, isn't it? If people see big flashy on screen, then that marketing will usually sell. So they don't really need to innovate. And honestly, they don't want to alienate the people that like their game to start with. It's like, do you really want to change the formula of Halo? What about Gears? What about God of War? All of these series are very much iterative. They're franchises. They are not games. This is something you have to bear in mind. They are a franchise, which means you can't mess with a franchise. You really, really can't. It's very important not to disturb the core fan base because those are the guys who are going to be lining up on the day to buy your product. Now, it is kind of unfortunate because the other way of looking at it is, hey, we've got a lot of money. We can actually afford this risk. The thing is, the old adage, sadly sadly holds true. You don't get rich by writing a lot of checks. And as a result of that, it means in gaming context, you don't get rich by taking a lot of risks. And a prime example of that would, of course, be Call of Duty. You do not see that risk taking in that franchise at all under any circumstances. It just does not happen. It is one of the most stale franchises I can possibly identify right now, which is a real shame considering where it came from. The first two games were fantastic, as were the expansions, but there you go. So that's the reason. 
indie devs need to distinguish themselves, which is why they innovate. And big publishers, developers, and franchises don't. They already have an established market, which they then need to cater to by not rocking the boat too much. This one comes in from an anonymous viewer that says, as a huge fan of Dungeon Siege 1 and 2, I was really looking forward to the release of Dungeon Siege 3. I recently played the demo, and apart from the difficult controls on a mouse and keyboard and what I consider to be a relatively console-y interface, I enjoyed the game overall. However, it was not what I was looking for. See, when I hear about a sequel to one of my favourite franchises, I have certain expectations. I expect a product that retains what made the original so popular, while hopefully improving in areas where the original was lacking. In my opinion, what made Dungeon Siege so popular was its gameplay. I realise it was only a demo, but after completing the demo, it just didn't feel like a Dungeon Siege game. That isn't to say that Dungeon Siege 3 won't be a good game, just that it pays no homage to its namesake. So many titles just don't seem to grasp how important that familiar feel is. Command & Conquer 4, Supreme Commander 2, and Duke Nukem Forever are all examples of games that have strayed from what made the original great and suffered for it. My question is this, why do developers feel that a sequel must be different from the original in order to make it good? Are they so worried about the game not being different enough a la Left 4 Dead 2 that they are willing to alter what made the game good in the first place? What an interesting email that was to follow up the one that we just talked about there. It's like, why do they never change the mechanics? Oh, why do they always change the mechanics? Yeah, as I say, neither of these are entirely true 100% of the time. There's no universal truth in that regard. Sometimes, yes, they completely change things around, and sometimes they don't. I mean, for instance, why exactly is Call of Juarez, the cartel, based in modern Mexico? Whereas the other two games were cowboy games. Why is that exactly? But that's not the most extreme example. You've given several examples right there. Command & Conquer 4 is a weird one because I can't actually explain it because it's such a massive deviation from the formula that it makes absolutely no sense. It's more of a deviation from the formula than Soul Survivor was, and I'd be surprised if any of you actually remember that one. No doubt a few do, but still. CNC 4 was just... I, I think it was, we're going to take C&C and, &C and we're going to take like elements from Dota and things like that and add persistence in because everyone's doing it these days and it was a goddamn disaster. Dungeon Siege, I can understand why it's turned out that way because Dungeon Siege 3 will be on consoles. As far as I'm concerned, Dungeon Siege 3 is coming out to capitalize on the fact that Diablo 3 is coming and the interest in these hack and slash Diablo style RPGs is waxing once again and they've got this one designed with the console in mind and I would agree that it's not actually a bad game. I, I played the demo and for the most part I pretty much enjoyed it but you're right it's not really a Dungeon Siege game unless you count Throne of Agony which was the PSP game. It's very much like Throne of Agony. And it's not really like Dungeon Siege 1 and 2. It's a different kind of game. And that really is the reason, honestly. They wanted to cater to a console market, so they developed a hack and slash. And there aren't all that many hack and slash RPGs on the console at the moment. And it seems like Dungeon Siege 3 would work pretty well on there. That's the reason, and it's an unfortunate reason. It really is. They didn't want to develop it in the same style as Dungeon Siege 1 and 2, which would not work on consoles, certainly. Dungeon Siege 1 and 2 were a bit more Baldur's Gate-ish. You know, obviously, nowhere near as complex, but they were Baldur's Gate-ish games. Whereas this is more Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance. The funny thing about Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance is that actually that was a really good game. The second one, especially. Those were really fun, but they weren't anything like Baldur's Gate. No, not under any circumstances. They make radical design decisions generally based on the fact that they want to appeal to a wider audience. It's kind of the same thing that they did with Supreme Commander 2, although I have to say Supreme Commander 2 to me just feels like gas-powered games screwing up again, which they've been known to do. They did it with Demigod, for instance. They are not a particularly reliable company at all, so... I think that maybe just came down to ineptitude, which is a shame because I adore Chris Taylor and a lot of his ideas, but that was just falling flat on its ass. They felt Supreme Commander was too focused on build orders and managing the economy and things like that. They thought they could get a wider audience if they dumbed it down, and that's exactly what they did. And you know what? It was a flop as a direct result of that. They took away from what made Supreme Commander Supreme Commander. And since you mentioned Duke Nukem Forever, this one comes in from Brad that says, I watched your 45-minute Duke Nukem Forever and noticed four real trends in your distaste for parts of the game, which was linearity, scripted events, glowing things, and turret sections. I'm not counting the fact that it didn't let you shoot a gun for a while as one. We can all see the problem with taking that out of the Duke game. But I was wondering what is majorly wrong with the aforementioned 4. Is linearity a bad thing if they're trying to tell a story? And are scripted events bad if they give you a vital clue or piece of information? Also, I see the problem with static turret sections. Why not give us options to move it? Miniguns and so forth. 
What are your thoughts on how games developers should change these in video games, especially first-person shooter, in order to make it more enjoyable and make it feel like we aren't having our hand held all the time? Because if I'm completely honest, a bit of prodding and poking in the right direction is good in an RPG or MMO due to size, but a little bit more credit should be given to the intelligence of the average gamer in a linear FPS, am I right? Also, I'm a fan of Easter eggs in games, but Duke Nukem Forever seems to have gone overboard. <laughs> Well, that's to be expected, honestly. Duke Nukem, especially 3D, was laden with all sorts of references, as is this one. I don't really object to that. But you're making a good point in saying that is linearity a bad thing? Not always, but it depends on its extent and what it actually adds to the experience. If it's linear, then there's got to be a good reason for it beyond simple laziness. That's the main point. If you're using linearity to hide lazy level design, then that is a problem. Scripted events, are they bad? Uh, scripted events are not bad, but if it's nothing but scripted events to the point where you can't even open doors yourself, that's a problem. It's the same problem I've got with Modern Warfare 2 and Black Ops and things like that. You can't even open doors yourself. That's a real problem. The game keeps you to a rigid pace and will not allow you to go outside of its comfort zone. That's a bad thing. Yes, scripted events are cool, but bear in mind quality over quantity. Few and far between. If you've got a really awesome scripted event that's awe-inspiring, then fantastic. If you don't, well, therein lies the problem. It's funny what you're saying here, because everything that you are saying basically is Crisis 2 in a nutshell. Like, are scripted events bad if they give you a vital clue or piece of information? No, and Crisis 2 does it really, really well. Is linearity necessarily a bad thing? No, but then again, Crisis 2 does it really well. It is a linear game, but it gives you large, wide open areas and plenty of options as to how to approach them. So that's fine. The linearity helps keep the game going in that respect, but still gives you plenty of options so you don't feel like you're having your hand held. And movable turrets. Once again, that is something that this game does. Crisis 2 actually allows you to rip a minigun off its turret mount and go to town with it. Not the only game that does, I might add. Yes, Bulletstorm does that as well. Also a highly linear game. A bit too linear, honestly, in my opinion. But at least it had gorgeous set pieces and some of the best scripted events I've ever seen. If you've played Bulletstorm and you've done the level where you're being chased by the giant wheel of doom, or you've done the one where you fall off the dam, do not tell me you were not awe-inspired by that, because my god, that game is... Oh, it's so good in that regard. It's a spectacle game. And it does it really, really well. And as a result, because those scripted events are so good, you can look over that. And the thing is, often these scripted events have to be very high fidelity for that to work. I think the thing about Duke is that all of the scripted events just aren't impressive in any way. If they were, then it'd be like, oh, wow, that's fantastic. But they're not. They just fall flat. And there are far too many of them. And it's not just down to big set-piece stuff in terms of the scripting. It's down to everything is scripted. Can't open this door. Gotta wait for this to finish before this continues. The whole thing is on rails in that regard. That's a big problem. And one last quick question here from John that says, Why don't consoles like getting hacked? And no, I'm not talking about that PSN thing. I mean, people having access to mod the software and hardware of a console. If people can make your console better and help improve it after release, then why make it so hard to do so? And then punish them for doing it. Does it not help the lifespan of a console? And if a nerd can hack in 24 hours what a department has probably taken months to develop and integrate, then what is the point? Well, you're encroaching on the DRM argument there, as well as who owns what bit of hardware. I do believe that you should own your hardware. I don't think the idea of licensing hardware that you've purchased is reasonable in any respect. It's the same reason I own a SIM-free phone, for instance. I want to be on whatever the hell network I want to set up a contract with. I don't want to be restricted in my choice of device or what I can actually do with it. In this case, you do have to see it from the company's perspective. Have a look at the Dreamcast, for instance. One of the biggest failings of the Dreamcast was that it was so easy to play copied games on it. It took barely any effort whatsoever. Hell, there was a loading disc put out that would do it. And later on, you were able to incorporate self-loaders into the copy. That was awful. And it really contributed to the downfall of that because rampant piracy killed the interest in developing for the platform. So less and less good games came out. And then, of course, that platform died. And I love that platform. I really do. The whole argument about hardware DRM, for instance, saying, oh, well, it doesn't stop hackers, so what's the point is, it's not for that. It's like a padlock doesn't stop a dedicated bike thief. It's there to keep honest people honest. You don't make it really easy to play copied games on your console. That said, yes, I do believe you should be able to modify the hardware 
And saying that putting a custom OS or a mod chip or some kind of custom loader onto your console is the same thing as piracy is saying that owning a CD burner is the same thing as piracy. I'm a firm believer in innocent until proven guilty, as I hope the rest of you are as well. Okay, folks, that is me done for the week for the mailbox. Thank you very much for watching. You can email in mailbox at cynicalbrit.com with topics for future shows. Have a great, safe, and fantastic weekend. Remember the Shoutcraft Invitational on Sunday. Check out my DreamHack announcement video for more information about that. And I will see you next time. Sam! I need a plan of attack! Run. That's not a plan!